Pablo Escobar is dead. The Medellin cartel has fallen and has given rise to the Cali cartel. Were you concerned about whether your teammates who are there to back you up are on your side? And if you don't join us today and start working with us today, we're going to kill you. Hello and welcome to Best Case, Worst Case. This is your host, Jim Clemente, retired FBI profiler, former New York City prosecutor and writer-producer on CBS's Criminal Minds. And with me today is my lovely co-host. Hi, everybody. Hi, Jim. It's Francie Hakes, former state and federal prosecutor. Well, it's great to have you, Francie. And today we have a very special guest. We're really excited because this superhero and longtime friend and colleague that is here with us today has amazing stories to tell. My name is Carson Ulrich. I'm a retired special agent with the Drug Enforcement Administration. Well, it's great to have you, Carson. Thank you for coming on Best Case, Worst Case. Yeah, thanks so much, Carson. I'm really happy to have you too. You are our first DEA agent that we have been able to talk to so we can take our listeners behind police lines of the DEA. So thanks so much. Oh, it's my pleasure. I mean, what I'm going to talk about today is not necessarily your traditional gumshoe police work. It's something that is unique to the DEA. That's great. Well, let me ask you first off, what got you interested in the DEA out of anything you could have done in the world? I knew that I wanted to serve. I wanted to have a life of service. And I didn't know if it was going to be in the military, per se, or if it was going to be in some form of law enforcement capacity. As a young man, I grew up about 12 miles from the FBI Academy. So I would visit it and I would see the new agents, what the DEA calls basic agents. And it was something that I researched and um, I desired to look into it. I applied for the DEA about six months prior to graduating from college. Wow. So Carson, it sounds like you were determined to serve. What specifically brought you into the DEA after you graduated from college? Well, I remember going into the academy and the DEA agents were wearing black BDUs and they had their combat boots and were getting marched around. It's very militaristic. And I just felt that it was a more aggressive posture, a more aggressive type of training. I felt it suited my needs or what I wanted to do. But while I applied, it took forever to get hired. The background investigation and the process to get hired takes multiple years. And so I applied for a commission in the Navy and was selected to go to OCS. And I was going to aspire to be a Naval Special Warfare Officer, a SEAL officer. Wow. So just before you keep going, some of our listeners might not know, you said black BDUs. Could you explain what that is? Yeah, black BDUs are a battle dress utility. It's a black military uniform. The DEA training, there's a stark contrast. And I don't want to get into the elbow rubbing or competition between the FBI and the DEA. But the philosophy of training at the DEA and the FBI Academy is vastly different. Right. But we're both under the Department of Justice. So we're colleagues that way. There's different missions. And I know you I applaud you guys. And I'm sure we're going to get into some stuff that shows why your training is vastly different than the FBI's. Yeah, it is. And there's always a mutual respect. Yeah, absolutely. We're both 1811s, both special agents, both Department of Justice. It's just a mission. Each agency has different missions and different taskings. Right. So you just said 1811s. And I'm going to ask you to explain what that is, too. So everybody knows. 1811 is the job designator for a special agent. For a federal special agent, I should tell our listeners. And Carson, it's funny that you bring up the different training between DEA and FBI. As an assistant U.S. attorney, one of the things I got to know after probably I don't know, a few months of working there was how different the personality types were between agencies. I always like to say that I could spot the kind of agent someone was just when they walked in my office, even if I didn't know who they were or where they were attached. There was just a certain way of dressing, of carrying themselves. I could always tell whether it was ATF, DEA, FBI, or Secret Service, all of whom I worked with, but all of whom had very different cultures. So it's really interesting that you say that about training. Yeah, it's probably because the DE agent was carrying a machine gun. <laughs> it kind of gave him away. Yeah, although I will have to say, my brother Tim did that a lot. I think one time when he was going through security at the airport, about to board a plane, one of the TSA people at the gate took him aside and said, okay, we're going to do a random search. And he said, um, no, that's not for me. And he held, holds up the paper that says he's law enforcement and he's armed. And the guy said, no, you've been randomly selected. You have to be searched. And so he opened his jacket and said, well, are you going to look for nail clippers or scissors when I have two submachine guns on? <laughs> that kind of got the guy's attention and he didn't end up searching Tim. But the fact is that there are some FBI agents who go to that extreme as well. So Carson, you obviously became a DEA agent. Uh, you said that you had signed up for the military first. So what took you into the DEA? How did you get there finally? It was a matter of timing. And I, I really believe Providence stepped in and took control. But I was at a party and outside of Quantico and a friend of mine who was a Marine Corps scout sniper, someone I respected. And we were sitting and talking and I told him, you know, I was looking to go to OCS with the Navy and um, he asked me what else I thought about doing. And I told him I had applied with the DEA and he said something that was prophetic, something that really resonated with me. And as it sunk in, it's kind of carried me on my entire career. He said, the Navy is not at war, but the DEA is. Hmm. I didn't fully understand everything he meant, but I eventually did find out exactly what he meant and what I would consider or call it the forever war. Yeah, that is the war interdicting drugs, if I'm not mistaken. It is. And oftentimes... I take exception to the characterization as a drug war. You know, it was coined, I guess, during the Reagan administration because it's not fought like a war is. But my experiences have brought me into many war zones and many austere environments where the lines of 
counterterrorism cross counter narcotics. Mm. And these terror organizations are, in fact, funded by narcotics. Right. So just a little aside before we move forward, can you just tell us what the DEA stands for? Uh, certainly. It's the Drug Enforcement Administration. And it's an arm of the Department of Justice. And what are the crimes that you investigate in the DEA? We investigate violations of United States Code Title 21, which primarily are conspiracy cases, possession with intent to distribute narcotics. But those crimes are really what brings us into the organizations that we're targeting. Most of what the DEA does is not drug driven. It's not like we want to work a meth case over a heroin case or a cocaine case, but more the organizations that we're targeting that are peddling these drugs and their propensities for violence. Well, I have to thank you and the DEA in general for basically having a landmark case that allowed me as an FBI agent, as a behavioral analyst to testify as an expert witness, because the examples used in the case were about DEA agents testifying about drug paraphernalia and drug operations and things that are outside the ken of the average juror, because you guys were able to testify about basically the different operation procedures, the way they're structured, the way that a, a drug deal goes down on the street. Because of that, we were able to testify about behavior of child sex offenders, for example. Yeah. One of the things that's unique about a drug agent, on the one hand, it's very dangerous because it's a volatile environment. It's volatile because the crime is being committed in your presence. But it makes it much easier to prosecute. You get the criminal to reenact the crime over and over and over. Someone doesn't deal drugs once, like eating a potato chip. They don't do one deal and they're done. They have to continue to do so, and you simply do it in the presence of an undercover or have them talk about it. A murder is investigated in a reactionary way. You're trying to collect evidence, physical evidence and such. We simply get the drug dealer to bring the drugs to us, and it's very hard for him to say that he's not a criminal at that point. Well, Carson, it's so interesting that you say that. As an assistant U.S. attorney, I got to work with some great DEA agents. And to take our listeners behind police lines here, most people in the public don't necessarily know how complex and difficult and dangerous it is potentially to be a DEA agent. And you have to be super smart. These are the men and women who are applying for wiretaps under Title III of the federal code. These are the people who are going undercover in drug organizations in the United States. And I know you're going to talk today about something I think most people in this country are very unfamiliar with, and that is what the DEA does to interdict drugs at the source. So let's talk a little bit about the case you came to talk about. Can you tell us where you were in your career when this case came into you? Well, this specific case was kind of sprung on me when I landed in Bolivia. And how I landed in Bolivia was intrigued by what my friend said about the DEA being at war. I learned about a program in the DEA called Snowcap, which is a special operations jungle interdiction program where agents can volunteer and go to receive training from the U.S. Army Rangers through this very rigorous selection process. And if you passed it, then you were part of these tactical teams and you would receive a language training. I went to the Defense Language Institute and learned Spanish. And you would be sent in teams to Bolivia, Guatemala, Peru, very dangerous areas where the jungles of those countries were being used to manufacture cocaine. And you said something interesting there, Carson. You said that agents have to volunteer for that duty. Yes. It was about a 70% attrition rate because it was very difficult. It was a selection process. It was put on by the Ranger Training Battalion. You had to be able to live and operate and thrive in a very austere, difficult environment with military equipment. And so you had to have a number of attributes, but at the very minimum, you had to be physically capable of doing it. Well, so Carson, you said that you volunteered for this Operation Snowcap and it landed you in Bolivia. Was this early in your career? Yeah, I was a baby. I was, I think, 25 years old, 26 years old. I raised my hand immediately, went right to snowcap training. I mean, within a year of graduating from the uh, academy, language training, I went to selection training, and then right away, right outside of selection, I went right to Bolivia. I was on a team in Bolivia, and I was the junior guy. I was the baby. So what happened when you got there? What was your mission? Well, there was a mission that was being planned by one of the senior agents that was assigned to the Bolivia office, and they were going to execute it, and he asked me if I would go. It was unusual. Wow. Yeah, it was unusual because I was the junior guy, but I was very physically imposing. I was a big guy, six foot five, 220 pounds, very aggressive, very idealistic. Well, you're still all of those things, Carson. So don't let anybody think that that was in the past tense. Well, whatever he saw in my personality, he said, look, I want this guy to go. And my boss at the time, he said, question it. And uh, you want to take a more experienced guy. And he said, I'm, I'm taking this guy. This mission actually imprinted and molded my career, my perception, my job. It was something that I had no idea really what I was getting into. I learned about it as I arrived. And they identified the threat and briefed me on what we were doing. And we planned it and executed the mission. Great. So tell us a little bit about, at the time, what was the context like? What were the cartels doing? What was going on in Mexico, Colombia, Bolivia, where the DEA obviously has tracked most of the drug trade that comes into the United States? At this time, Pablo Escobar is dead. The Medellin cartel has fallen and has given rise to the Cali cartel in Colombia. The Mexican cartels have really not risen. They're a later generation of cartels. This is probably 93. So the target that we were given was a group of Sicarios or assassins from the Cali cartel that were operating and controlling the drug trade in Bolivia. So Carson, Sicario, is that like the movie Sicario? 
Yes, that movie came out about two and a half years ago. Well, can you explain a little bit to our listeners? This is one of those great behind police lines moments where they get to understand uh, how things really work, which they often don't, and the public get to hear that. When you say you're targeting a group of assassins, what, what was the point of that? What was the thinking behind that target? Well, in, in my opinion, those targets were some of the most significant at that time in the Western Hemisphere. It was a group of henchmen that controlled by force the drug trade within Bolivia. Every kilogram of cocaine base that was manufactured in Bolivia was transshipped out under their basically guidance and control to cocaine hydrochloride labs in Colombia. Could you explain to the listeners what the difference is between base cocaine and cocaine hydrochloride? Certainly. It's part of the manufacturing process. Cocaine base or paste is different than what we recognize it as far as working in U.S. law enforcement as far as crack cocaine, but it is similar in some ways. So cocaine is manufactured from the coca leaf and they make coca paste that is converted into cocaine base where there's a one-to-one -one conversion rate from cocaine base to the usable form of powder that we recognize it in the U.S. as a consumer or as a law enforcement professional as cocaine hydrochloride. The cocaine powder is cocaine hydrochloride. Right. So cocaine hydrochloride can be ingested by basically inhaling it into your nostrils, whereas cocaine base can be smoked, right? It can be lit and then you can breathe in the smoke and that actually is how you consume it. That's correct. The um, cocaine base in the United States is what we would call crack cocaine. And when you take a drug into your lungs, the amount of sensitive membrane and vessels that are in the lungs have the greatest effect on the body, even more so than injecting it into your veins. Wow. Because of the surface area and how much of that drug hits the body right away, it has the greatest effect as well as the worst effect. Someone is going to become addicted even after a single use of crack cocaine because it's a smoked drug. Smoking something is probably one of the most devastating ways in which these drugs affect the body. All right. So tell us about this operation that you have planned in Bolivia. How many people are going down there? Who are they? What are you going to do? Well, you have to understand that at the time, there was another operation called Oso Ordo, which is Spanish for Golden Bear. And it was an intercept program. The traffickers had a VHF radio network where they would all communicate and they would track the movement of our helicopters. And there was only seven Huey helicopters in the country at a time. And they have just two props. And those two props make a lot of noise, a very long and loud sound signature. And whenever we flew, they wanted to know where we were so that they could counteract anything we were doing by moving around and avoiding us whenever possible. Our target were these seven assassins from the Cali cartel who were in some ways mythical, like the Yeti. There was debate over whether they even existed. And we had an informant that we sent in who stayed at this ranch who would report in on them, but didn't see them, but was aware that they existed. And he reported that this ranch was under their control and that they lived in the jungle nearby and that they controlled all the cocaine coming out of the country. And they did it by force and they were very violent. So was your mission to go in and arrest or what you might call interdict those seven assassins in order to interrupt their ability to traffic in drugs? Yes, that was our mission. And those capture type missions, especially in a jungle or a hostile environment, are very difficult. They have a low success rate because you're entering an area and you're trying to do so undetected. And if they simply know you're in the area, they just displace, they move around, they'll hide from you. And trying to find these guys in the jungle is a very low probability for success. But that was our objective. Well, and presumably you're looking for seven assassins, and I would guess that makes them seven very dangerous men. Yes, very dangerous. But again, that's why we're there. That's why we receive all that training. And that's our role is to go after people like that. So you know that they track your helicopters. I assume that means it's very difficult for you then to utilize helicopters to just sort of land on their head because they're going to hear you coming. Yes. They would hear the helicopters and then they would react to them. And then because they're in a jungle environment, there would not be a landing zone close enough. So we couldn't land directly on them. So a helicopter assault mission was immediately out of the planning. We didn't consider that. But we had to insert by helicopter. We're in areas that are so remote that you can only access them by aircraft. So we had to get within the area by helicopter. So what did you decide to do? Well, we decided that we would try to ninja in on them and sneak in on them by Zodiacs, inflatable rafts over the cover of darkness, and that we would offset our infiltration point by some 50 kilometers and spend the day and most of the evening coming down under the cover of darkness by river to land on them undetected. That was the intention. All right. So what did you do? How many people? What kind of equipment did you have? So our training was with the Army. The Ranger Training Battalion selected and trained us. Our equipment was very military. We wore camouflage, face paint. In addition to having select fire weapons, we had hand grenades, as well as I carried an M79 grenade launcher, which is a 40 millimeter grenade launcher. And it fired a number of specialty rounds, which are all heinous and nasty, as well as fragmentation grenades. Wow, that sounds pretty serious. So you were expecting a firefight then? It wasn't that we expected it so much as we had to prepare for it, as it could have been a very likely scenario. We don't know what's going to happen, but these are extremely violent people, and we had to be able to defend ourselves. So Carson, you also used some terminology 
technology that is unfortunately currently in the debate about guns going on in the country right now. You said you had a select fire weapon. What does that mean? Well, the term assault rifle is generally misattributed to cosmetically what a gun looks like. The term assault weapon comes from an underpowered cartridge, not a full power rifle cartridge. And that is select fire, meaning you can fire in a full automatic mode so that it's easier to control select fire or full automatic fire. In effect, you can toggle between semi-automatic and automatic fire. That's correct. Right. And this also sounds to me, uh, just thinking about how you look from the outside, like you are really loaded down. I mean, in fact, literally weighted down with all this equipment. Yes, we carried a lot of equipment. And that's one of the reasons you had to be in physical shape. We had carried military radios. And at that time, they were very heavy. We had to carry extra batteries. We had to carry extra ammunition. And we had to be able to sustain ourselves for numerous days in the jungle. So supplies and things. What about body armor and camouflage on your face? I mean, are you really going in this like we've seen in the movies where you've got face paint on? Yeah, we did wear face paint, but this is before body armor was available. It was not part of an inventory for soldiers. That came much later on. At this time, we carried what were called LBEs, load-bearing equipment, and they were like suspenders. We're talking about 1990-era military load-bearing equipment. What's your estimate, Carson, on how much all your equipment and gear weighed that you had to carry? Well, we varied it according to the mule, and I was the biggest mule. I probably carried around 80 pounds of equipment, and some of the other smaller guys would not carry as much. We would cross-load it out and divide it. Water and bullets were the primary things we had to have with us. Everything else as far as comfort and sleep were secondary. Sleeping out there was miserable. I cannot imagine. So you've got all your equipment. You've got the mission planned. You have information on these seven Sicario assassins and a ranch. So what's your goal? What are you going to do? Well, once we land, we launch in the morning and we're about 50 kilometers away from what we believe our objective was. And at the time when we were planning the mission, we were going into an area where we didn't have maps or charts. And I saw two pieces of equipment for the first time ever. I did not know what they were. And I learned how to use them. One was a GPS and it was a giant box that had like a digital readout. And the other was a digital camera. And that, that time everyone had film in their cameras and they'd go to the mall and they would have it developed. This camera had a three and a half inch floppy disk. And I didn't understand how it worked. You, you can plug this in a computer and print photos. Yeah, this is, you wake up, it's new technology. I'm like, okay. So we did a flight over and we had the informant roughly show us from the air. And it's difficult for them to orientate themselves from the air to what's going on the ground. Roughly pick out the ranch that he thought it was. We took photographs with this digital camera, and then we took pictures of the river to try to map out the course because we knew it would be dark and it'd be in the middle of the night. This is before night vision, where we would have to insert and find and locate this ranch some 50 kilometers downriver. Well, it sounds like incredible amounts of planning had to go into it before you inserted. And then you say you insert by helicopter 50 kilometers, which is roughly 25, 30 miles. Is that right? Away from the actual ranch? Yes, it's about 30 miles away. And one of the questions Jim asked earlier that I didn't answer was how many were with us. We went with a very small footprint. We had 10 Bolivian police special forces called UMAPAR. We had one of the DEA special agent, including myself. He was the planner of the mission. He was assigned to the Santa Cruz office in Bolivia. And we brought two Coast Guard guys with us. Once we set our boats up and went down river, we found the ranch at about 1 a.m. Back up for one second, Carson. You mentioned that you had 10 Bolivians with you. Certainly, uh, we've all heard about corruption that goes on inside these police and federal police organizations in Latin America, certainly at that time. Were you concerned about whether your teammates who are there to back you up are on your side? Well, that's always a concern. Corruption in Latin America within the police communities is much more accepted and much more expected than it is in the United States. It's part of the environment. And as a result, even though these are our counterparts and we work with them in a shoulder to shoulder role, we compartmentalize. We don't give them an opportunity to capitalize or sell any information that we provide, especially if it's mission related. They don't know the objective. They don't know where we're going, the location. They simply know it's a direct action mission. So when we rehearse actions on the objective and do all the planning, we don't share with them exactly what the target is or where it is located. And that's to protect your lives, right? It is. It's to protect our lives. It's just a part of our tradecraft. It's how we operate. There are certain units in the foreign environment that call the sensitive investigative units that later on I began to work with that have a little more assurances from us, but corruption is rampant in these Latin American countries and we just can't take any risk. Right. And I know my brother told me that one of the problems with the Mexican police departments and the federales there is that the cartel leaders will show up at their graduation and sit behind different graduates who have joined the police force to try to do good and stop drug dealing and stop the killing. And They'll be tapped on the shoulder sometime during the ceremony, and these people will say to them, you see the people that are sitting around and behind your wife and kids? They're our guys. And if you don't join us today and start working with us today, we're going to kill them. And so under that threat of their lives and the lives of their wives and children, they actually join the bad guys right from the start. And so that's the kind of thing that you, as a legitimate law enforcement agent, are susceptible to these basically spies and operatives right inside the ranks of the police departments that you're supposed to be working with. It is. It's a common problem. In fact, to the point where Mexican cartels would hire their special forces, Mexican army special forces guys, to act as assassins for them to the point where they recognized their own power and started their own cartel, the Zeta cartel. The Zetas are founded as Mexican former special forces assassins for the Gulf cartel, and they have since evolved into one of the most 
violent and most powerful cartels in Mexico. It's incredibly frightening, the situation that you had to deal with. You're here in a foreign country, you're in a jungle, you've got basically three people you can trust and 10 that you can't. So what happened once you inserted about 30 miles away from this ranch that you suspected to be a hub for drug trafficking? Well, we had interviewed the informant that had been in the area that gave us information on this. And he stated that he knew that the Colombians lived in the jungle not far away. And as he stated, they had, in his opinion, eyes on that they could observe the ranch from the safety of the jungle, from a clandestine location. But he did not know where they were located. So our number one concern was when we went into the ranch that we did it quietly and that the Colombians that were in the jungle hiding did not hear us. Because once they heard us and saw us, they could do whatever. They they could have shot us. They could have ambushed us. They could have left. Any of which wasn't good for us because we wanted to try and capture them. That was our mission. Well, it sounds like guns and grenade launchers wouldn't be all that quiet. So you really want to complete your mission without shooting anybody. Yeah, that's always the objective. You always want to use the most reasonable amount of force necessary. If you find yourself as a cop in any capacity wanting to use force, you're really not going to be long for the job. You really want to help people, even bad guys, honestly. You're not going to exist without them. And you learn right away when you're in a court of law, it's not an adversarial situation. The only person that really cares about the outcome is the defendant. There's no reason for you to lie or for you to get emotionally invested. You're going to go home to your family that night. The person that's invested in the outcome is the defendant. And he's the only one in the courtroom that should have that. You have to learn that right away. It's not us versus them until it's over with at that point. When you're hunting them down or you're interacting with them, it can become very violent and you have to defend yourself. But it's not like you hate these people. It's not like you, you have any animosity towards them. Even they do the most heinous things, it just is not personal to you. That's such an interesting difference between, I think, how law enforcement is sometimes portrayed, Carson. And I'm so glad you bring that up because that's the beauty, I think, the majesty, if I can overuse that word, of the United States law enforcement. They are professional. And that is, I think, what sets us apart from much law enforcement in the world. And that is that our people are like you and like Jim, professional, doing your jobs. It's not a vendetta. It is just a matter of doing your job in the way that you were trained and protecting the public. That is correct. You're only pursuing the truth. You're only pursuing facts and evidence. You are not invested in the outcome. And if you don't have the evidence, and if you don't have the amount of information you need, then you're working the wrong case. You need to apply your resources where you have the greatest chance of finding the biggest possible criminal and having the best resources to accomplish it. All right. So let's get back to the jungle. You're in the jungle. You've inserted yourself 50 kilometers away. How are you going to get to the place where you want to find these guys? Well, we waited until first light, nautical twilight, and we quietly entered the residence. And it had been raining the entire day and evening before. So we had to sleep. I didn't even sleep, but you're laying in about six inches of water And you think of a tropical environment as hot, but you're hypothermic. When you're immersed in water and it's raining like that and you have no shelter, the ground and the water sucks all of your body heat away from you. And so it's very miserable. So I found myself dripping wet, standing at gunpoint, waking up these people with my hand over their mouth. Now, I know that these people are directly involved. I know that these people are working for the Colombians, but that they are not the Colombians themselves. They didn't have any weapons in the ranch. We looked for weapons and we had to wake them up. We had to do it in a manner to not alert anyone else around us that we were there. And so the goal is to interrogate these people working on the ranch to find the seven assassins that are actually the focus of your mission, right? That is correct. And who we think at the time are in a line of sight or just an earshot of where we currently are. So what do you do? You're at the ranch, you wake everybody up, you do it quietly. Uh, Is there a firefight when you get to the ranch? No, no. We take possession of the ranch and all of its occupants without incident. We wake them up where you try to calm these people down. You're nice to them. And you simply say, we have some questions to ask you. You have camouflaged, heavily armed people waking you up in your house, it's a little disconcerting. And so you want to de-escalate the situation as much as possible, and you don't want to be volatile or loud or aggressive. But aren't you worried that possibly they're going to be able to communicate with people who do have guns, who do want to kill you? Oh, no. No, we're, we're very much concerned about that. They are in our custody. So they don't have free reign. They're flex cuffed. They're segregated. And we begin to interrogate them and ask them about the Colombians, because we know that they are in cahoots with them. That ranch is where they fly all the drugs out of. Wow. All right. So what do you do next? since they didn't have the drugs. Well, as we're interrogating them, I hear an outboard engine on the river. I hear a motorboat coming towards us. And so I grab my rifle, I go outside, and I look down the river, and I could hear the boat coming, but I can't quite see it. So I enter the water, and the water's very deep on the bank and about chest deep. And I enter the water, and I submerge myself, and I move through the foliage, which is the river grass. And I look to see what boat is coming. And I'm expecting, it's very likely these Colombians that are coming in a boat towards the river, and that they're coming for breakfast, or who knows what they have. And I'm by myself with my machine gun, waiting on them. And uh, we didn't have that many people. And we were all tasked with different things. And I'm the first one to hear it. And I was closest to the river, and I didn't have anyone else with me at the time. So you're by yourself, weighted down with a ton of equipment, submerged in a river, waiting to see whether or not you all are about to be basically invaded by seven assassins who have an almost mythical reputation for violence. Yeah. The only thing I would correct it is that 
most of my equipment is in a rucksack and that rucksack had sat down. And so when we move around, I didn't have all that equipment on me. I just had my vest, so bullets, water, and a rifle, and you know, just basic needs. Most of the radio and other heavy equipment was set aside and I didn't have that in the river with me, but everything else is yes, true. So what happened? Well, it was a canoe with an outboard motor and it was just had one occupant and I could tell it was likely just a villager. He wasn't wearing a shirt. I could see no weapon on him. Um, I could see his torso as he approached and fortunate for me and unfortunately for him, he was on my side of the river and close enough to the foliage that I could go underwater and wait for his arrival. When he arrived, I, I removed him from the vessel. That sounds like A, a scene right out of a horror movie, but B, you probably scared the hell out of him. Oh, I, I know I scared him because he defecated himself. I got it. So you got him and who did he turn out to be? What, what was the deal with him? Well, I, I came out of the water. I removed him from the boat. I also grabbed his boat and pulled it aside because it's his boat. And if he's a villager, on the one hand, we have to be concerned about our safety, but we're also concerned about hearts and minds and our perception of the people that live there that we're trying to protect. And they are not our enemy in any way. But I had to take control of him and I pulled him up to the side of the riverbank and I asked him about the Colombians. And he's shaking his head, no. And I'm like, what do you mean, no? I'm, and this is in Spanish. And I'm asking him, where are the Colombians? And he's like, I don't know. And I said, you do know where they are. Will you show us? And he finally conceded and nodded his head, yes, he would show us. So the people inside the ranch didn't tell you where the Colombians were. And it just a random villager happened upon your location. And he's the one who's going to lead you to the assassins. Yes. And so we quickly come up with what we call our frag order fragmentation order. We're going to shift and react to this information. And I grab the DE agent, the two Coast Guard guys, and we bring two Bolivians with us. And we're going to go on a reconnaissance, scouting, looking with this new tour guide that we have. Well, Carson, this story, it sounds like it's just about to get really crazy because you're in the jungle, you've already captured one guy, and now you hope to be able to use him to get closer to the bad guy's camp that you're looking for, right? That's the plan. But we really have no idea how it's going to turn out at the time. Well, we will revisit this when you come back, and hopefully we'll hear all the details about what happened next in the jungles of Bolivia when you were trying to stop some dangerous drugs from being produced and brought to the United States. Okay. Yeah, Carson, I can't wait to hear how this ends. I feel like I am sitting in the jungles of Bolivia with you, and I am really grateful that you've come to tell our listeners your story, and I can't wait to hear the rest. Well, I look forward to next week as well. Great. Well, thank you for listening to Best Case, Worst Case, and Carson, thanks for coming, and we'll talk to you very soon. Excellent. I'm looking forward to it. For now, signing off for Best Case, Worst Case. Till next time. Best Case, Worst Case is an XG production. Produced by Jim Clementi at Empire Studios, LA. Engineered and edited by Mike Thal. Music composed and performed by Simba Sumba. And hosted by Wonder. You can listen to Best Case, Worst Case on your favorite listening app. We are on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Stories about child sexual abuse can make us feel powerless, but the good news is that there are organizations working to prevent abuse and keep kids safe. Darkness to Light and their Stewards of Children Prevention Training has trained more than 1.4 million adults to protect, recognize, and react responsibly to child sexual abuse. But there's more work to do, and with their 4 million by 2020 goal, Darkness to Light is setting their sights on training 4 million adults around the country to keep kids safe. By donating to Darkness to Light, you can help reach this goal that will make communities across the country safer places for kids. It starts with you. Visit www.d2l.org today to give. That's www.d2l.org.